Hi, I'm Robin Miller. I'm the host of Miller Chat. Today, I have four guests today, and we're going to talk the topic before everybody introduces themselves. We're going to discuss religion. So I like to go around and have people introduce themselves. Hi, um, my name is Bridget Hilton, and I'm a Shrewsbury resident, and I was raised in the Christian faith, and I think I'm more leaning agnostic at this stage in my life. My name is Phil Najami. I teach in Shrewsbury, and I was I come from an Arab home, but I was raised with no religion to speak of, and I came to Islam when I was about 12 or 13, and I've been a Muslim since then. Oh, welcome. Um, I'm Sanam Zaire. I'm a Shrewsbury resident. Um, I was born and raised a Baha'i. Um, I'm still a Baha'i. I work in an Islamic school. Mm, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to meet you all. I'm Bonnie Valor-Pulley, and I'm a Shrewsbury resident. Um, I was born and brought up in a Hindu um, culture. Um, and um, at this point of my life, I welcome everything and anything that comes to my way. <laughs> I believe in everything. <laughs> well, this is a different type of show because, um, as you see, everybody talked about the religion they were brought up. I was brought up Jewish. Um, and um, as a culture, especially in American culture, we don't go around, and we introduce ourselves, but people don't go around usually talking about religion. If you could tell me in Shrewsbury, uh, the center of town, people talk about religion, you'd be like, what are you talking about? So here we are talking about religion, and it's good because it makes us feel weird talking about it. And the question is, why is the society, especially American society, why are we so uncomfortable talking about it because when I was growing up my mother always said you don't talk about three things you don't talk about politics you don't talk about religion and you don't talk about how much money somebody makes <laughs> and that was the 70s because I'm generation X I don't know if that's different among you guys so as we talk people are going to talk about the different uh, religions they're from their impact and uh, our commonalities our differences and um, and anything else that we need to bring up but before we do Phil you have to introduce up your food Okay, so the plan originally, <laughs> a week or so ago, well, until a few days ago, was that each of us would bring some dish that was emblematic of, or at least uh, connected with, in some way, our, uh, all our four traditions. And I missed the email, or didn't read closely enough the email that said that's no longer on, so I did make some, in English, grape leaves, in many other languages, dolmas or dolmades, in Arabic, the uh, warak aynab, which just means the leaves of grapes. And it's meat with rice and spices wrapped up in grape leaves and then boiled in lemon juice and water. And uh, they're sitting here on the table for some reason. I am very happy delicious. that you did yeah. not get that email. <laughs> <laughs> Gladly take one of these. You're brave, thank you. So as you see, each culture has their own foods on what they eat. And I think it's important to recognize and acknowledge and uh, Sometimes try different foods. Mm -hmm. Now, you were all raised in your uh, religion, but before we get that, people sometimes, one of the reasons people don't talk about religion is because sometimes they don't know the difference between religion and culture. Like the Jewish religion could be a culture, but can also be a religion. Have you had that growing up? Like people don't know what to ask or know what to say. So how do you educate them like for you? How do you educate about your cultural religion or both or maybe none? Yeah, so I mean, I think my experience with the intersection of culture and religion, being someone of African descent um, from, my family's from Jamaica, you know, uh, Western religion was something that was brought to the island hand in hand with mm -hmm. the enslavement and subjugation of my ancestors, right, as they were trafficked from Africa yeah. to the Caribbean. So I think um, this is probably the reason why Jamaica has a such high levels of, it has more churches per square mile, more Christian churches per square mile than any other country in the earth. Oh, um, wow. And I think part of that comes from that legacy of colonization and, and enslavement, but also why I think a religion like Rastafarianism w would emerge there. Um, the, the, I'm certainly not a scholar on Rastafarianism, but I do know that part of that arose from a sense that these Western religions that were brought in and imposed mm. were not authentic to the people that were living on the island at the time. And that's sort of where this had emerged from. Um, so I think there is, for me, you know, you can find just as many Jamaicans who are Christians as who will sing Bob Marley's songs, which are very pro-Rastafarian and anti-Christianity. Um, so I think it's, um, 
an interesting dynamic um, in our culture, the role that religion plays um, versus kind of the legacy, the familial matriarchal legacy of the country. And then as a culture, an American culture, we don't talk about how Americans in colonial times invaded lands mm -hmm. and forced upon religion. People don't talk about if they're from the island of Jamaica saying, well, you know, they don't tell their history about, well, my culture was forced the religion. We don't, we don't talk about that for some strange reason. Like we're, it's like taboo. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, for me as my religious, I, I think I've become more of a spiritual person as mm -hmm. I've gotten older and I, mom and dad, forgive me. Um, but I think part of the reason that is, is because as I begin to understand how religion evolved in my ancestors' lives, mm -hmm. the more I start to question it because yeah. it's hard for me to understand how something as supposedly sanctified or as sanctified as religion is supposed to be in your life could come hand in hand with something as oppressive and ruinous as mm -hmm. the system of transatlantic slavery. And so that for me has been a big point of confusion. Anybody else wanna talk about it from their perspective? Um, I've had a very different experience mm -hmm. with religion because the Baha'i faith emerged in the 1800s. So it's a fairly newer religion. So there isn't that much intersectionality mm -hmm. with culture and religion at this point. There may be in the future. The religion emerged in Iran. So, mm -hmm. and I'm Iranian, so it's some of, some of what I had perceived at a younger age to be religious culture was actually just Iranian culture. The religion itself mm -hmm. is the second most widespread in the world, so right. there's a lot of diversity in terms of how people celebrate the holidays and uphold the traditions. We do have the same holidays, but everybody does it differently. Even Baha'i weddings, they're all just completely different. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing that's mandatory in a Baha'i wedding is to say we will all verily abide by the will of God. Aside from that, it's just completely what people bring into it from their personal preferences, their own cultural experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so, so my experience has been very different because it's a, it's a newer faith. Um, oh. So I'm, I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to get there, but for mm -hmm. now we're uh, the there there isn't that much intersection with culture. When it formed in the eighteen hundreds, was Iran Persia at the time, or was it Iran? It was Iran. Iran yeah. Because mm -hmm. yep. okay. some people still, if you read the media, they still call it the Persian culture. Or even the mm -hmm. history books, the kids are learning about the Persian culture. I don't know how many kids in elementary even know that Iran is was Persia. I, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's um. You know, even the language is called Persian. I just call it Farsi. I find mm -hmm. it less confusing. Farsi is the Persian word for Persian, but um, oh. mm -hmm. I just find it generally less confusing when I call it Farsi because it kind of detaches from that whole history. Right. It doesn't necessitate a history degree to <laughs> differentiate <laughs> between Persian and Iranian. You just say Farsi, and it, it seems to do the trick. Anybody else? Um, in similar experience that I have, like is I can relate to Sanam because. Hinduism is um, oldest, but at the same time, um, we have like from in. I'm from India, and in India they have like, like so many, um, at least like twenty five uh, or more different like languages and like you know and hundreds of dialects. So every dialect have like their own way of following mm -hmm. what the Hinduism mm -hmm. means. So uh, it has always been like tailored to like you know what their beliefs are even though like the god is one but there are many forms so it it's up to you how you want to um to to have that belief and faith right how you want to perceive it so um it's it i have a very uh you know diversified experience mm -hmm. within the hinduism itself on like you know with different friends from different states that I I had like interactions with and with their weddings and cultures everything is different, so it's interesting when the British colonized until mm -hmm. Gandhi, were people allowed to have different cultures and yes. religions? They yes, were. they do. Oh. Within Hinduism, the the way they practice oh. is different because of the uh, different like caste systems that they yeah. have. Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, right, that's right. So how it was perceived was different. And we did, uh, it. Uh, I mean, India, within India, we have like s other religions also, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Christianity mm -hmm. yes. and also the Islam. We, it's a, a nation with like multi-cultures. 
Um, so and um, Hinduism is fairly more accepting or like uh, more like you get you're free to do how you would like to do compared mm. to other religions. Interesting. That's how I perceived it. And do they still have a caste system? Um, yes, they do. They do. <laughs> they do have caste system, um, and in more towards the cities, it's becoming more diverse mm -hmm. uh, compared to uh, the you know more like what do you say um like some rural areas they are still like practicing oh. yeah in some parts of the country yeah i mean a lot of people argue mm. we have a caste system here so <laughs> you, you know it just depends on what With you call it with a different uh yeah. names yeah it depends on what you call it yep. different twists yeah. yeah and phil uh, so the question is is like what was my experience of the, the of your where religion meets culture yeah so I grew up with really no input about religion. And uh, my family had been uh, Arab Christians, actually. And my father was raised in that tradition, but he could just kind of stop practicing. He, he can't be bothered remembering what he believes in. <laughs> so um, we weren't brought up with anything. And my mother was from the South, actually, where, um, contrary to what you were mentioning before, uh, contrary to our squeamishness about discussing religion here, she told me that the first question you ask somebody back which, where she grew up in Texas after their name was, what church do you go to? Mm. Oh, So, it, yeah, just from region mm. to region in the country, the comfort with discussing religion differs quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Although if you said, oh, I go to, uh, you know, the uh, Beth Israel, oh, mm -hmm. that might have raised some hackles in Texas in the 50s. Mm. Um, <laughs> but for me growing up, a lot of my input was cultural. It was the Arabic language, which I heard but never was taught any of, sad to say. And food was a big part mm -hmm. of it. And what's funny, we learned the, the Arabic words for foods growing up, but not how to say, hello, my name is Phil. <laughs> um, and it was a lot of politics as well, especially mm -hmm. regarding uh, you know, the conflict between Israel and Palestine yeah. and the Israeli occupation of Lebanon mm -hmm. uh, throughout the 80s. Those loomed large over my childhood. And that's what a lot of my input was. It was more cultural. And when I started to learn more about Islam, then I realized that Arabic language and some elements of Arabic culture are integral to practicing Islam anywhere in the world. You know, the, our scripture is in Arabic and reading it is an important part of practicing and, and trying to, never endingly, but trying to perfect your, your practice mm -hmm. and your faith and all that. Mm -hmm. um, however, they're really, and I had a, point, a, a friend make this point to me years ago, if you think about it, there, it really is no Islamic culture. It's practiced differently. In, like, the, for example, I know I keep cutting off my sentences and interrupting myself, but I'll, I'll make sense at some point here. <laughs> um, it, okay, the most populous Muslim country in the world is Indonesia. And oh, sure, they, the that. young students there learn to read Quran, they learn to read Arabic and stuff, but it has nothing to do with Arab culture. And so the input that I had growing up was you know, mostly things like this and fist shaking at Reagan and his foreign policy. But um, as I came to learn more about religion, I saw that yes, Arabic is important, especially the language. But as uh, Islam has been diffused over the rest of the world, the centrality of Arab culture is less important and that's incidental to my being a Muslim. It's sort of what brought me to it because I knew distantly it was part of my background mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's it's it didn't compel me and it didn't define my experience or my you know lifelong pursuit of of islam and learning about my religion things like that what about korea my career well in the united states having that background on oh your last name we uh, were very ethnic at one not time, a lot of people recognize my last name okay it's funny because I've been to the village in Lebanon where the name comes from, and everybody has the last name. Mm -hmm. You'll see it written everywhere mm -hmm. on doors and mailboxes and stuff. Uh, and um, yeah, oh, I'm looking for Najami. Oh, who? You, you, which Najami? Oh, me, Najami. <laughs> Eight people pop their heads out of windows. Me, me. Um, it's like the scene at the beginning of the Beauty, of, Beauty and the Beast. Bonjour, bonjour. Yeah. Najami, Najami. Um, and the girl from Hocus Pocus, Kathy Najami. <laughs> she's yeah, a cousin. She's your cousin. She's like a fifth Maybe. or sixth cousin. I dressed silly up like, that. like her for Halloween. Yeah. Wow. Oh, no, I dressed up as Bette Midler. From, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. I hear they're making a sequel. They are. Um, yeah. It, so, um, yeah, she's probably the most famous person named Najami. Uh, <laughs> but um, 
Did you ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I asked you based on your last name. I'm so sorry. I'll explain. Yes, right, right, right. Okay, so I don't exactly look the part, and a lot of people don't recognize my last name. That's what I, me I meant to begin with, and I wasted three minutes. Um, a lot of people see it and they think it's Armenian or something, and we just cut off oh. the I-A-N at the end. Like, oh, they were Najamian when they immigrated here, mm -hmm. but now they're just Najami. Or a lot of people think it's Hispanic and they pronounce it Nahemi. Mm. So I get a million guesses about what I am. I don't exactly look the part, look as much the part of an Arab as, say, my dad and uncle, who could be, you know, sheikhs sitting in a tent somewhere wearing leopard skins. <laughs> and, like they really look the part. I don't so much. Uh, my mother is is white. She's of Western European uh, ancestry. So growing up, I could sort of pass. But especially at the beginning of the first Gulf War in 1990, that's when I sort of decided, mm. I'm. I don't like what's going on. I don't identify at all with the fervor surrounding this war in the mm. States. I object to all of this, okay. and I'm going to be very openly Arab. Mm. And it was a choice I made at one point. A reclamation. Yeah, mm. right. And once I was you know, about 10 years old and old enough to understand what my uh, background was all about. So yes, I, I had a little bit of resistance from my classmates who, you know, as you were mentioning before we began, could be cruel the way young boys can be. Mm -hmm. And the more vocal I was about opposing the war and being an Arab, the more cruel they could be in response. But no, I haven't been, um, I wouldn't say that my, my experience as an Arab and as a Muslim in this country have been a veil of tears. It's just been, w w when I choose to resist what's going on and be vocal about it, yeah, it's not the most welcome opinion publicly, but that's changing slowly. Well, the thing is, I, I want to uh, expand on looking the part mm -hmm. because I'm Jewish. I'm a Reformed Jew. There's four types. There's the uh, Hasidic Orthodox, the uh, Conservative, and Reform. Meaning, we I don't wear the the bruker, and you know, I don't wear a, you know, I don't celebrate all the holidays. You know, and I blend in. My ancestors, when they came from Russia, well, Ukraine. 1900s, um, they had to change their last name. So Miller's not really my name. So, you know, we were taught in the 70s that, you know, you have to blend in. Mm -hmm. Don't make noise, be the part, whatever that meant. And now I'm like, okay, whatever. I mean, I tell my son, because my son is adopted and he, my husband's Catholic and I'm Jewish, so I say whatever you want to be when you're 18, but he gets both parts. We do it in an objective manner. Though when I'm, we adopted and people say, well, how are you going to raise your kids? <laughs> I'm sure you hear that too, if you have two different faiths or cultures. Mm -hmm. And my husband said it best. Talk about the shared humanity between them. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Right? Yeah. People don't see that. And do you find that too when, uh, first of all, has anybody ever said to you, you don't look the part? Well, it's interesting hearing his experience yeah. because I'm not Muslim, but I look the part. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my experiences in this country have been shaped by my proximity to Islam. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of the, the negative experiences I've had have been because people perceive me as Muslim. And they actually put me in an uncomfortable situation, too, because sometimes people will make anti-Islamic comments to me. <laughs> oh. And I... You know, wow. my first thought is I'm not Muslim because I'm, that's my identity. But at the same time, when I say that, they, they're like, oh, okay, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. as, as if the problem was <laughs> the, as, the identification, the identification not the, and yeah, not, not the, the fact insults. that they're saying yeah. it in the first place. So oftentimes I don't even correct people because I, I feel like it empowers them to continue saying what they're saying. So, um, so it's, it's interesting because my experience has largely been shaped by the fact that I look Muslim. Mm -hmm. And the same with my family as well, especially after 9-11. We, mm. we had my dad. My dad, um, he, he had some experiences. They called our car the terrorist mobile. Oh, they, we terrible. had things left on our doorstep, name calling, all of that. Mm. And all of that was just not knowing about the the very diverse experiences of everybody in that region and mm -hmm. also the villainization of, of Muslims. So it, it was always, my identity has always been kind of shaped by all these things. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny because you're actually both Arab and Muslim. I'm neither <laughs> Arab or Muslim. <laughs> and yet I've been, I've, that, that's been my experience just simply because of how I look. And yet if my dad could choose one of us as a child, he would immediately pick you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll go with her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and people in the 21st century still 
you know, even at my son at the middle school when 9-11 happened, even before he went there, they had some issues. They were, the kids mm -hmm. who were, I guess, who looked Arab or Islam, they were picked on. You know, I have to say, so I went to a local private school and we were required to take a religion class. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was sophomore year where you had to take this class where you had to read all the major religious texts. You learned about mm -hmm. all sorts of world religions. You, you know, and I really credit that class with kind of touching on the shared humanity mm -hmm. of people from all over the world. Even though I didn't learn every single thing about every single religion, it mm -hmm. just kind of opened the door a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, and I know that in the public school, you know, we have separation of church and state and they have to provide a fair and balanced education that respects all religions in order to teach it in school. But I wish that they would not shy away from that as mm -hmm. much because I think getting an early primer on the fact that people believe things that are different than you, mm -hmm. but they are still human beings deserving of your respect and of their privacy, et cetera, et cetera, is an invaluable lesson mm -hmm. that I wish more people got sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something we've lost in our schools as mm -hmm. we separated public schools, especially from religion. I think we've gone really too far because sometimes we're scared to talk about it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important because it builds not just tolerance, but friendships because mm -hmm. it allows you to kind of see that yep. shared. You know, I have friends in every faith. I'm in multiple religious communities. My children can speak at length about multiple religions. And it's because we go out of our way right. to to build these friendships and to teach them these things. Um, I, I think it's something that could be taught in schools. You know, Instead of completely omitting these conversations, we could learn about different cultures, different religions, all of that intersection between them, um, and really encourage these conversations because they're important, because that diversity does exist. Um, we just are taught to shy away from it instead of jumping right in and saying, you know, who are you, where are you from, mm -hmm. what do you believe? I think there's a fair right that if we expose people to different ways of thinking that they'll shy away from the, the things that their parents are trying mm -hmm. to impart on them um, and I think a, I think right now America is struggling with that mm -hmm. in a lot of ways with a lot of the fears around learning about race in the classroom mm -hmm. and learning mm -hmm. about other things in the classroom sex mm -hmm. education and about you know all of these things because there seems to be this idea that ideas are dangerous mm -hmm. for some reason um, which I guess they can be, but I, I do think that's what's causing this idea that we just have to completely brush a lot of this mm -hmm. stuff under the rug, and where mm -hmm. should people learn about these things, mm -hmm. and how. Yeah. Well, we got five minutes left, so anything else we want to talk about the shared humanity, inclusion, how's the climate in Shrewsbury? Well, we could wrap up with that, about religion. Is it ickish? Is it do we need to do more discuss open discussions? Do we need to make it part of those? Well, we can't tell the school what to do, but as a parent, can we ask, educate our kids? My kid did learn about different cultures mm -hmm. in his class, but there's one thing he did not say, and I didn't ask, did they talk about the shared humanity? And I don't think they did that. Mm. I think we briefly touched on it when I was a student at the middle school. I think you mm -hmm. learned like these are the religions, but, yeah. but it wasn't an in-depth right. look at it. But I think the town could do better with things like, for example, we know election day is set in stone, but it occurring the day after Eid, mm -hmm. when people are with their families mm -hmm. and maybe traveling and things like that. Those are ways that there is some intersection, and I think unintentionally, I don't think that was an intentional thing, um, between our public calendar, between what the public government is doing, and with how our town is and looks because it's increasingly diverse mm -hmm. and we need to take that into consideration and as we govern and, and look mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make this a thriving community or continue to be. Well, that's right. If we have the DI committee, it could be recommended. The DI committee, the diversity and equity inclusion, is that advisory? Right now, it's it's wrapped its work. It's presented its recommendations. Um, the Board of Selectmen, I think, is deciding what the next move will be regarding the DI committee. Hmm. Okay, so in the time we have, is there anything else you want to bring up in terms of any good recipes or uh, anything you want to talk about that or anything? I do want to say that was delicious, and I would mm -hmm. love the recipe for that. Um, oh, I'm actually, I'm going to I'm gonna take another one. Please, please. Yeah, help yourself. I'm going to dive right in here. I'll oh, actually please. share a YouTube video that my sister made on mm -hmm. how to make Jamaican Easter bun, which is something that we make every year for Easter. Easter so I can just share the link with you if you want to post it. Well, in the two or three minutes we have left, 
about change mandate. You know, when we talk about war, mm -hmm. we have right now Ukraine and, and Russia. And it's interesting now how all over the world, except for India and, and certain countries, and that's fine, that's okay, that we have a shared humanity that, that this is just wrong. We never had that before, you know, while I was growing up. But now all of a sudden it's like, you know, this is wrong, it should have been invading. This is not right. We have like, we have like that in India too. Yeah. Because the British, there are so many rulers who came um, mm -hmm. to India mm -hmm. and then the identity was taken away mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, so there was a struggle there, a huge struggle that nobody talks about even mm -hmm. in India, the mm -hmm. histories right now, they don't really like focus on, you know, what happened when, what our real identities mm -hmm. look like. And even I don't see anything in our global studies in mm -hmm. high school or anywhere in middle school. Like they don't talk about that, those struggles that mm -hmm. the countries have, the colonies not just India, but I feel like they should bring it back for the awareness mm -hmm. and how people have been treated and how it should be. Um, I think it's very important. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and, and getting diverse perspectives. I was yes. really happy with my son's elementary school because they did a section on Western expansion and immediately followed it up with books from the indigenous perspective. Nice. And Good. I thought that was Good. super important mm -hmm. and very grateful that the teachers mm -hmm. were thoughtful about that because yep. I, I did I was concerned when mm -hmm. I see all this stuff on Western expansion sure. coming home and I'm like mm -hmm. yeah okay what's gonna happen next <laughs> you know um, and so I think having as many of those different perspectives it's so important it is so important because I think our kids are growing up in like a very free like you can have a, any opinion mm -hmm. you want you're you're allowed to like you know talk talk mm -hmm. out loud which is good but at the same time giving them a right perspective on like you know on on different things would give them a little bit more empathy think mm -hmm. about like you know the surroundings and be make a conscious decisions um mm -hmm. i think growing up i feel like it's very important mm -hmm. that i don't see much yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it might be changing from what you said about your son's school, but that's a big blind spot mm -hmm. in American public education mm -hmm. yeah. is the self-awareness yeah. uh, of, you know, uh, whole projects that the U.S. itself has undertaken mm -hmm. that I were agree. colonial, mm -hmm. that were and continue to be exploitative. And it seems now that everybody is united and indignant about what's going on in Ukraine. And sure, why wouldn't they be? But where was this anger during the first and second Gulf War at, mm. at what was going on mm. in Iraq about mm. the the 200,000 people killed in the first one, mm. the probably uh, more than a million Iraqis killed in the second mm. Gulf War. Mm -hmm. uh, Afghanis, um, it, it people not only in, in countries that supposedly were uh, housing combatants, but you know, wedding parties droned in mm. countries like Pakistan. Mm. I mean, at some point it's, the responsible thing mm -hmm. for um, a country's education system to look, it's not just to be propaganda anymore. And I don't yeah. mean to become polemic about this here, but this does bother me, <laughs> that the US and other modern and developed Western countries really have this blind spot mm -hmm. and this um, cultural amnesia about acknowledging things that our countries have done, whether as, you know, democracies or empires or whatever we were at one point 100 years ago 200 years ago or 50 years ago to other countries that happened to be sitting on resources that these empires wanted and i'm sorry i knew i, I sort of <laughs> flew off the hand a little bit there but okay. we okay. do need to look at ourselves critically always mm -hmm. individually and collectively i think and on that happy good. note <laughs> <laughs> well i'm glad and we have about 30 seconds left anybody want to say anything else before thank we close? you for giving yeah. me yeah. this opportunity yeah, thank you this is great we should yeah, do it again sometime yeah. well we are blessed in the 21st century that our kids who are gen z's or zoom i like the word zoomies Reminds me of the dogs that mm -hmm. run all over the place. I said the dogs now are zooming. <laughs> that zooming. They have this opportunity to talk about their shared identity um, and to be open with their voice. And we hope they continue that way because I'm also being educated at the same time. I'm mm -hmm. sure you are too. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming on Millichat. See you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All clear.